Hi there everyone, I hope you're doing well today. This video is going to be talking about an objection or worry with the utilitarian theory of morality that it might just be too demanding, that it might be unrealistic for real people. So in this video, we're gonna talk about utilitarianism and this worry in terms of calculations, the same worry in terms of motivation, and then this worry in terms of what's called supererogation. So as we mentioned, one influential and simple version of this theory of utilitarianism is what's called act utilitarianism, which says that an action is morally required if and only if it maximizes utility. Or in other words, if the action you do does more to improve overall well-being than any other action that was available to you at that time. All right, now, utilitarianism traditionally seems to set the standards for moral behavior quite high. So your action needs to maximize the well-being that exists in the world. So notice here, doing good is not good enough to make it moral. Only the best will do. Only the action that leads to the best possible outcomes overall compared to the rest is the right one. Anything else is wrong. Now, many worry that that idea is just too demanding. It's setting the bar too high. It's unrealistic to hold people to that standard. Is this right? Well, let's look at how it might do so. Now, most ethicists agree with the following principle that we can call ought implies can. If a person, P, morally ought to do some action, A, then it has to at least be possible for that person to do that action. Now, this is equivalent to saying that if it's impossible for a person to do an action, then that person isn't required to do it. So for instance, look, one thing it's impossible for me to do is to jump out of the seat and fly around the earth like Superman. Since that's impossible for me to do, it cannot be the case that I am morally required to do it. But now the question becomes, is there anything that utilitarianism demands of us that truly is impossible for us to do? We aren't computers and we're not always able to calculate and weigh all the consequences of our actions. And so if utilitarianism asks us to calculate the consequences of our action and compare them to all the other possible actions every time we perform an action, well, then it would look like it asks us to do something impossible. A very famous utilitarian, John Stuart Mill, raised exactly this kind of objection before replying. He says, utilitarians often find themselves called upon to reply to such objections as this, that there is not time previous to action for calculating and weighing the effects of any line of conduct on the general happiness. Here he puts it in terms of how much time you have to do these calculations. So for instance, imagine that a child is drowning. That is, you don't have time to sit there and calculate what all the consequences are of jumping in to save them or going to try to find a lifeguard or trying to call 911 or sitting there and watching them or calling for help. That is, you can't think about all your options and calculate the consequences because by the time you got done, your time for action would be gone. The child would have already drowned. This leads to what you might call the calculation argument. It is that any moral theory that demands the impossible must be mistaken. This is that ought implies can. But utilitarianism requires us to always make difficult calculations about the consequences of our actions, but it's impossible for us to always make these difficult calculations about the consequences of our actions. Thus, utilitarianism must be false. I know sometimes you'll say it's not just calculations, it's the motivations it demands of us. So this objection says that human beings just aren't saints. It's just part of human nature that we are largely selfish. We think about ourselves first. We think about our friends and family first. We don't think about, we aren't motivated by the general impartial well-being of strangers halfway in the world all the time at every moment of our lives. And so the idea here is we can be somewhat altruistic, but it's impossible for us to always act from altruistic motives where we're aiming at, where we're thinking about the general well-being of people all around the world. Now, yet again, John Stuart Mill raises exactly this kind of objection when he defends utilitarianism. He says that of objectors or critics who entertain a just idea of its disinterested character, so he thinks these 
people raising this objection correctly understand that this is a kind of impartial moral theory. But he says people who understand that impartiality sometimes find fault with its standard as being too high for humanity. They say it is exacting too much to require that people shall always act from the inducement of promoting the general interests of society. So it's just asking too much of us to always step back and take this impartial perspective and be motivated by that. This leads to what you might call the motivation argument. Yet again, any moral theory that demands the impossible must be mistaken, because ought implies can. Now, utilitarianism seems to require that people always act from these altruistic, completely impartial motivations, but human nature makes this impossible. We might be able to act somewhat from an impartial perspective or partly altruistically, but we can't do so perfectly. Thus, utilitarianism must be false. I know. Notice that each of these arguments includes three central premises. One premise claims that morality can't demand the impossible. Another makes a claim about what utilitarianism requires of us. And then the final premise tells us that it's impossible for us to meet that requirement. Now, a utilitarian could thereby try to defend their theory by arguing against any of these premises. And that means there's three general strategies a utilitarian could take to respond to these worries that the theory is too demanding. So the first strategy is just to reject premise one and argue that ought does not imply can. But this seems to be an uphill battle. How can a moral theory demand, how can we rightly hold people accountable for actions that are simply impossible for them to perform? Yet again, think about that example of demanding or holding me accountable for jumping out of my chair and flying around the world like Superman. Surely that seems illegitimate. Now, this seems like an especially difficult strategy for the utilitarian if you pitch the advantage of moral flexibility in terms of a morality for the real world like I did. It is one nice thing about utilitarianism is it seems to give us advice about what to do in difficult situations. It gives us advice about what to do in an imperfect world. It gives us a morality for how the world actually is as opposed to how we'd like it to be. In a perfect world, we would never need to lie. And so the rule that says never lie would be a good rule in a perfect world. But utilitarianism gives us a moral theory that's more useful in the world we actually live in that's imperfect, where abusers might come knocking on our door asking if we know where our friend is. Utilitarianism allows us to make the best of that situation and in that way, it seems to be a morality for the real world. But now, if you argue that ought does not imply can, it looks like it's not clear that the moral theory is really taking into account the kind of world, the real world that we actually live in. All right, but there's a second strategy you can take here. You could argue that the relevant demand is not actually impossible for us to meet. In this regard, consider how Mill tries to reply to the calculation worry. He says, look, there's been ample time for us to calculate the consequences of our actions, namely the whole past duration of the human species. During all that time, humankind have been learning by experience the tendencies of actions. People talk as if when some man feels tempted to meddle with the property of life of another, he had to begin considering for the first time whether murder and theft are injurious to human happiness. The argument says it's impossible for us to constantly be calculating these consequences. And Mill just replies, well, no, we can calculate the consequences because we don't have to do it right there and then. We have our entire lives to learn from experience about what kinds of things lead to harm and what kind of things lead to happiness. Since I've learned from all this past experience, I already know that stealing from another person is going to have bad consequences. I don't need to recalculate the consequences every single time I find myself in that situation. This strategy, though, seems less compelling in the context of motivations because I'm not sure it is possible for human beings to be perfectly altruistic. We, we aren't saints. But that leads us to strategy number three here. The strategy that utilitarians usually use to reply to this kind of worry is to argue that utilitarianism 
never actually place these requirements on people in the first place. So even if they're impossible to meet, that doesn't matter because utilitarianism doesn't ask you to meet those demands. So now consider Mill's reply to the motivation worry. He says, this objection mistakes the very meaning of a standard of morals and confound the rule of action with the motive of it. It's the business of ethics to tell us what are our duties, but no system of ethics requires that the sole motive of all we do shall be a feeling of duty. The motive has nothing to do with the morality of the action, though it has much to do with the worth of the agent. He who saves a fellow creature from drowning does what is morally right, whether his motive be duty or the hope of being paid for his trouble. So Mill's reply here depends on this distinction between what's called a standard of rightness and a decision procedure. A standard of rightness is a standard that provides the necessary and sufficient conditions for an action being morally right. So it tells us what the nature of right action and wrong action are, what makes actions right or wrong. A decision procedure is like a suggestion for a procedure we can use for making our decisions such that when we use this process, it will help lead us to making decisions that are morally right. Now, utilitarianism is best understood as proposing a standard of rightness, of telling us what the nature of right and wrong action is. Regardless of whether you do those calculations, if you do maximize utility, it's the right thing to do, whether you did it because you made calculations or because you went with your gut. If it actually maximizes utility, that's what makes it right, according to this theory. Performing calculations, in fact, might sometimes get in the way of maximizing utility. Because sometimes you might not have time to calculate all the consequences, where if you spend time trying to calculate them, you'd miss your chance. In which case, you're more likely to maximize utility if you don't sit there and calculate the consequences. Similarly, acting from love might sometimes help us to maximize utility. If an action maximizes utility, it's right. It doesn't matter how we came to the decision or what motivated our action. People can do the right thing for good or bad reasons. People can do the wrong thing for good or bad reasons. So our motivations, our calculations might have to do with whether we are good decision makers or whether we are good people. But according to the utilitarian, they aren't what make the action right or wrong. Nonetheless here, utilitarianism does always require that we do the action that maximizes utility. And that seems to imply that all of us are morally required to sacrifice and do a whole lot more than we're currently doing. How often do you eat out at restaurants? How much money did you spend on that? Had you stayed home and ate at home, went to the grocery store, instead of eating at fast food or fancy restaurants, how much money would you have saved? And if you donated that money, could you have done more good? You would have missed out on the pleasure of that quick food or that delicious food. But your pleasure doesn't seem to be as important from an impartial perspective as, say, someone who's literally starving getting a meal because you donated to a charity. Same thing with buying coffee from a coffee shop. How much money would you save if you stopped buying coffee at a coffee shop and just made coffee at home every time you wanted one? And how much more good could you do for the world by donating that money instead of spending it at the coffee shop? If you bought a new car rather than a used car, how much could you have saved by buying the used car? And how much good could you have done with that money instead? You could have still gotten by just fine with the used car, right? How much did you sleep in this last weekend? Could you have woken up a little bit earlier, gone and volunteered at the homeless shelter? When was your last vacation? Yeah, I'd give you time to relax, etc. But how much money did you spend on it? You might have been able to literally save someone's life by donating that money instead. When was the last time you ate meat? Like, How much sacrifice would it be to stop eating meat? and stop participating in contributing to factory farming. Now, if you have kids, would you pay for elective procedures? The worry here stems from the idea that some actions are very good to do, but still seem to be optional in some sense. This is what's known as supererogatory action or supererogation. This is when an action goes above and beyond 
what one is morally obligated or required to do. The action is admirable and praiseworthy. When someone does it, we think, oh, good for them. Like, that, that's amazing. But the action isn't morally required. All right, so this leads to the supererogation argument. It says that utilitarianism implies that no actions are supererogatory. If morality always requires you to do the action with the best overall consequences, well, you can't do more than the best. And so there is such thing as going above and beyond the call of duty. But some actions do seem to be supererogatory. Look, the person who maybe doesn't go on vacation and donates that money to charity instead, that's a very good thing to do. But a lot of people think it's going above and beyond what you're required to do, morally speaking. Same thing with giving up coffee and donating that money. Same thing with waking up early and going to the homeless shelter on the weekend. So if those actions are good to do, but not required, it seems like utilitarianism is false because it seems to imply that no, you are required to do whatever leads to the best possible consequences. There are some potential replies that a utilitarian can give here. So first, they might just argue, maybe morality is more demanding than people ordinarily think. Conventional morality is fallible. We tend to think of donating to the less fortunate, donating our own money. We tend to think of that as charity, as something optional. But maybe our common beliefs about this is wrong. Maybe we really are required to do more than we currently are. We should assume that all of our moral beliefs can withstand rational scrutiny. So maybe we should reflect on those practices that we make a little bit more critically. Now, morality may be demanding, the utilitarian might say, and utilitarianism does imply that all of us often act immorally. But that by itself isn't a reason to reject the theory, since, look, clearly all of us should recognize that none of us are morally perfect. I'm not morally perfect. You're not morally perfect. The fact that the utilitarian tells me that I sometimes do the wrong thing, that I'm not morally perfect? Yeah, so maybe I can learn how to be better by considering the utilitarian theory. I can aim higher than I currently am. So clearly recognizing how we morally fall short can be helpful since we now know what we're aiming for. We know what we can do further. Even if, look, maybe we shouldn't blame ordinary people for failing to live a morally perfect life. When we fall short and we give in and we sort of buy coffee for ourselves at the coffee shop instead of saving that money and donating it. Look, maybe we should be like, yeah, hey, I could have done better, but I'm not going to blame myself because I'm human. I'm fallible. There's a difference between saying we shouldn't blame ourselves and saying that we weren't required to in the first place. 